Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of May 20th, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we look at the good from this legislative session. It's mostly a list of what the legislature didn't do. Second, we look at the bad from the legislative session. It's a much longer list than the good. And third, with the candidate filing date nine days away, we discuss what we are looking for this coming election cycle. And now let's join Michael. Well, this is the recap, my friend, we're here. We saw the madness that took place on the final day of session, um, where they apparently just couldn't even follow the rules then. And so uh, let's uh, let's get down to it. Today's topics include the good with the session, uh, the bad with the session, and the nine days of uh, we're nine days before the election uh, signups and the deadline for uh, for filing. And what do you see about the election? So let's get started with number one the good of the election. And you were very clear to state, usually that meant they didn't do something. That was the good at this point. So give it to me, my friend. Yeah, the good of the session. I, I spent a lot of time trying to trying to come up with one good that was something they actually did. Uh, but at the end of the day, I, I couldn't come up with anything that was something they actually did. It sort of, sort of reflects my entire reaction to the session that all of my goods of what they did were things that they failed to do, things that somebody had proposed, uh, but in the end, the legislature uh, failed to do it. The first one, um, in in no particular order, uh, the first one is that they didn't pass, did not pass the Cook Inlet royalty relief, uh, the subsidies that uh, that you and I have talked about uh, a lot on the show over the last uh, over the last few months. That was the proposal by some to grant royalty relief, in essence, give, give the state's gas away. And, and turns out they were going to throw in some oil too. Uh, uh, reduce the royalty to, to trivial levels uh, on the state's gas in a way to try to encourage producers, their terms, try to incentivize producers to produce more. As we pointed out on the show, that wasn't that wasn't necessary. The utilities, if, if it really was royalty relief, that the, that the producers need. The utilities can just add a clause to their contracts that said, we'll reimburse you for royalties you pay to the state. In other words, include it as part of the price term instead of instead of the legislature giving away Alaska's resources in that, in that way. Um, the, the utilities evidently didn't want to do that or, or tried and, and, and the producers said, we got a better way, we'll get the money out of the state instead of you. Uh, but for whatever reason, uh, some continue to press forward with uh, with the royalty relief. And I think I think the good thing, a good thing out of the legislature is that the Senate stopped it. It passed the House um, who wanted to give the money away. Uh, the Senate stopped it and uh, and said, look, we don't see the case for this. We don't see the economics, why this is necessary. And so uh, the Senate backed off of it. That was, that was, and it didn't, and they actually requested an in more in-depth analysis of what the cost was going to be. That was part of the problem, right? There wasn't like a true cost measure of what was going on. I mean, you know, give credit where credit's due. Bert Stedman said we need a deeper analysis of this before we start giving it away. Yeah, it's a uh, they they, it, they wanted a deeper analysis of whether it would actually motivate the producers, and the answer at the end was it it 
they didn't think it would. I mean, the analysts said they didn't think it would. And again, part of this is, I mean, keep in mind, the utilities had the tool to do this all along. The utilities could add a royalty clause into the contracts that said, we'll reimburse you for royalty uh, and take it in as part of the price. The utilities have had that tool in their pocket all along. And, you know, it, 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 it why the state has to step in in, 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 in a situation like that and give up money uh, when the utilities have that tool in their pockets just never made, never made any sense to me. I mean, I lived I, in, in a prior, in a prior life, I spent a lot of time in Louisiana where there's a lot of royalty gas state has royalty gas. And, and there's been those sorts of issues from time to time also about, well, producers don't have enough incentives. Well, the free market works. What happens down there is that the, is that the utilities or the pipeline purchasers or the fertilizer companies, which are big purchasers in Louisiana, all entered into excess royalty clauses and, and bought it. Never even never even thought of going to the state and asking for a bailout. They just took it upon themselves. So I, it, it's a good thing that the legislature didn't pass that. Now, hopefully, we will see the utilities move forward on market-based solutions as opposed to continue to hold out for uh, for subsidies from the legislature. Well, we dodged <laughs> we dodged a real bullet too there at the end because at the very end they added in that reserves based lending, where we would borrow money against the res- we'd borrow money against our own reserves. As I mean, I I'm trying to figure out what genius dreamed that up. You know, we Michael, lease reserves and you're going to use it as a, as a collateral. Michael, that passed. Oh, did did it pass both? Oh, I thought it was connected to the royalty. So it was it was it, it, it was in a different bill. It was oh, in the God. electric tra- it was in the electric transmission bill and it passed. And it's on my list of bad things. I'm <laughs> sorry, I didn't, didn't mean to get ahead of you there. Go no, ahead. No, no, no. You re- it, it 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 I mean you could easily confuse the two, but it but it did pass. Uh the second uh thing that didn't pass is we didn't pass defined benefits, we didn't pass a permanent K through uh K through 12. Uh, increase. And those are both good things. Without a fiscal plan, we know who pays for for those additional, that additional spending. And we had enough additional spending uh, in this legislature uh, alone, which is going to be something I'll talk about in the bad things. But but that pile on of additional defined benefits and uh, the permanent K through 12 increase uh, would have just added more more spending. It may be fine to, to, to do those things, or it may not be fine, but it's not fine to do them in, without a fiscal plan because we know that they end up getting financed on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families through additional PFD cuts. And, and the failure of the legislature to address those, I take is a win. I mean, there was a lot of pressure to, to pass defined benefits. Kathy Giesel was a champion of it, former conservative, now who knows. Kathy Giesel was a was a champion of that, tried to stuff it in a, a bill, indeed, uh, right at the end of the legislature to get it uh, to to put it in a bill that that they viewed as a house must pass. And so tried to stuff it that way. Um, there were efforts at the end to get the permanent BSA increase uh, right at the end of the of the House session. Uh, there were efforts by the by the minority to 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 push a push the permanent BSA uh, increase. Both of those got killed and both of those are good things because they're being, they were pushed in the absence of a fiscal plan. People in this state have gotten way out in front of their skis in terms of spending before they, before they have a plan for how to pay for the spending and, and thinking they'll just shove it off on middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts and stopping additional spending. We didn't stop enough this session. Right, but stopping additional spending until we get a fiscal plan in place, I think, is a is a is a win. Well, and the, we never even we never even got a not even not even having a fiscal plan, but we didn't get a completed fiscal note, did we? I think they'd been waiting on that fiscal note on the defined benefits plan, and I don't think the expanded note ever really actually came out. There was a lot of discussion, but no actual numbers, was there? Well, Giesel came out with what she said was the final fiscal note uh, out of the. Uh, out of the state's normal actuaries uh, on the on defined benefits, but but it was it was one of those you know the you know the actuaries are are really you know getting their the thumb screws put to them when they started out by saying well if if you don't have not that we believe this by the way but if you don't have 
you know, people staying longer as a result of defined benefits, or if you don't have more employees as a result of defined benefits, more permanent employees as a result of defined benefits, or if you have a normal, if you have normal attrition, I mean, it was, it was calculated in that way. There were a lot of contingencies that if they came true, then the, the cost wouldn't be very high. That's how the actuaries finally, finally dealt with it. But Let's recall that their first reaction, I mean, and these are actuaries who deal in numbers, who deal in probabilities, who deal in projections. Re recall their first reaction was you increase defined benefits or you, you restore defined benefits, you're going to have more people staying around. And if you have more people staying around longer, you're going to have higher uh, 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 pension costs uh, once, uh, once they retire. And if you have defined benefits, you're probably going to have more people joining the state workforce. And if you have more people joining the state force, I mean, they they did that calculation at the very beginning. And that was the that was the fiscal note that Giesel and others didn't like that, that, that added a lot of money. So what she finally got at the end after applying the thumb screws was, well, if those aren't true, <laughs> if all those assumptions, all those assumptions we in our actuarial you know, profession made at the beginning, if they aren't true, well, yeah, it doesn't cost as much. I mean that's that's the sort of fiscal note we got at the end, so it it wasn't it wasn't very convincing and I and I think it makes it very it. good that that it got we dodged that bullet. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I didn't mean to sidetrack you there. No, no, no. That's it, it. It was a good side story about what you know what she was trying to sell at the end, uh, and and it was great that people you know continued to resist that. Um, the the final thing I have on my list of good because it's not a very long list. The final thing. I have on my list of good is we didn't pass 25, uh, POMB 2570. Recall that at the end of last session, the Senate had passed a, a change to the to the PFD statute to change it to POMB 75 with some with some with some contingencies that if you know if if, if revenues came in above levels, then we then we might change it. Uh, sort of unachievable contingencies, and um, and had passed POMB 2575. That came over to the House. It was referred first to House Ways and Means, and and to Ben's credit, Ben Carpenter's credit, they they acted on it quickly. They amended it to POMB fifty fifty. They took out the contingencies, the the riders, um, and forwarded it on to House Finance. House, House Finance never did anything with it. Um, it got in the in the course of the debate over the constitutional amendment on the PFD, it got pulled up, uh, brought out of House Finance, ended up sitting at the end of the session on in House Rules, but. The good thing is, the good thing of all that is we didn't pass, the legislature didn't pass POMB 2575 as, as some hoped it would. It reminds me of Samuel Clemens, uh, Mark Twain's comment about the only time we're in danger is when the legislature's in session. So the good stuff is the stuff that they didn't do, uh, unfortunately. I'm with you, Brad. This uh, This session, it's kind of amazing that really all the good was the fact that they didn't actually do and i think i think that's the thing people want to go down to juno and do something when a lot of times the best course of action is to either hold the line or actually repeal laws that we have on the books uh you know i would be proud to say i didn't pass a single piece of law. i think the whole time i was in the borough assembly i think i actually only passed one or two things over five years and they had to do with protecting private property rights and empowering the people in the road service areas that was pretty much the only bills that i sponsored the entire time i was there I felt like I was running a rear guard defensive action the entire time. Well, I mean, a great example of that is this whole Cook Inlet stuff, right? I mean, yes, we have an energy crisis. Now we have to do something to deal with the energy crisis. Well, other states have energy crises and they let the market resolve it. They let the market step in and, uh, and, and, and deal with the situation through the price function or through the terms function. Um, you know, uh, uh, well, we we can we'll get into this in deeper in a minute in the bad, but but this whole reserves guarantee deal that we that we've now passed uh, for the Cook Inlet gas, that we're going to guarantee you know provide lending and guarantee and and provide lending on the basis of, of of reserves in the in the in the free market in the real world. I mean, either the utilities provide those loans uh, because they want the gas, they have an obligation to serve. And so they provide the loans because they need the gas in order to meet their obligation to serve, or they enter into take or pay contracts that commit them to purchase a certain amount uh, that the that the purchaser is then able or that the producer is then able to go out and use a security for a loan uh, in the private market. In Alaska, we just run we just run off. You know, somebody says the word crisis, and the next word out of somebody's mouth is legislature crisis legislature. 
Right. I mean, it's just, right. right. It's just, it, it's, well, it, it's, it's like the free market doesn't exist. And, and even Republicans get into this, right? Well, and in nowhere did we see a discussion of, well, let's talk about the importation of gas. I mean, you know, it's like, it's, it's not even just an afterthought. It is literally a last ditch hue and cry. And the problem is because we're not pre-planning it now, when it does come down to that, because I guarantee you it'll come down to that, then we'll be in full-on crisis mode and we won't get the best price possible. We won't get the best terms. We won't get anything because then it will truly be a crisis. It'll be last minute and they'll know it and they'll have us over a barrel head. I mean, because we're not planning this stuff out. Well, I I mean, it's the utilities obligation to plan it out. They have a certificate obligation to serve and they have a, they have, I mean, they're, they're, they get all sorts of benefits in terms of in, turn, in, in a in, in terms of a guaranteed rate of return and guaranteed cost recovery in exchange for the certificated obligation to serve. And so the utilities have this obligation to go get supply. That's how the market operates. And 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 hopefully now that the legislature didn't pass royalty relief, uh, hopefully the utilities are going to say, well, I guess the legislature is not going to come over the hill and, and save us from our obligation. We're going to have to go do it ourselves like we're obligated to do. It's uh, it's amazing, especially when you highlight how it's done in other areas. You know, again, the free market will find a way if you would just get out of the way. The free market would do it, and that's the astonishing thing. Welcome back to the program, the Michael Duke Show. Brad Keithley, our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Weekly top three. We did the good about the legislature, which was mostly the lack of progress on some things. Now we're going on to the bad, which is really bad if the good was mediocre the bad is really bad brad what uh, what do we got here well the bad is a mixture of things they didn't do that they should have done and things they did do that they shouldn't have done so it'll i'll have a little bit of both in here uh the 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 major bad uh out of this session is they didn't pass a structured fiscal plan remember when the when the when the house majority formed one of their top three items in fact the top item was Fiscal, uh, 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 fiscal reform, a fiscal plan. We're going to get you a fiscal plan. They set up a special committee, Ways and Means, chaired by Ben Carpenter, that had the speaker on it and had the chairman of the House Education Committee on it and had the chairman of House Re Resources on it and had, a, and had the chairman of House Transportation, House Transportation on it. Uh, a power committee, sort of a, com a select committee of, 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 of the movers and shakers from the other committees, including the speaker. Uh, they set up ways and means. We're going to pass a fiscal plan. We're going to we're going to do what legislatures haven't done since we got into this crisis in the in the early 20 teens, and it all came to nothing. I mean, they 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 the only thing that really got that got out of there that was really helpful was constitutionalizing the PFD. That got to the House that 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 got through the the House Finance Committee, got to the House floor, and then died there. And we'll talk about that in a moment as another bad. But but the but the constant but the but the whole fiscal plan discussion that they started off the session with just went poof uh, in the night. And that leaves us with no fiscal plan, which frankly is what some want, because in the absence of a fiscal plan, the fiscal plan has defaulted to just keep taking PFD cuts, keep spending, and keep taking PFD cuts. And that's the fiscal plan, that's the fiscal plan we've come up with sort of an ad hoc session to session, whatever justification you need to get you through the additional spending you want to do uh, type of fiscal plan. So I, to me, the big, the big zero, the big, the big failure of this legislature was to, was to pass uh, a fiscal plan. And, and I, and, and I attribute that to both sides, Michael. I mean, when the constitutional amendment made it to the floor, it, it got a majority, but didn't get the super majority it requires as a constitutional amendment because the Democrats, Democrats, the independents, the House minority uh, didn't vote vote for it. So they bear some of the blame. But the Republicans bear a huge share of the blame too. We're not going to pass a constitutionalization of the PFD. We're not going to protect the PFD until we have replacement revenues in place. We have long since left the point of no return with respect to being able to balance the budget just on- Some legislators said that directly, by the way. I'm sorry, I, I hate to interrupt you, but some some legislators said that directly. We're not going to talk about the PFD until we have some other way of revenue, but nobody else was listening because they don't want to, they, they don't want, no, no. And it, and it was a failure of Republicans. We had this super committee at House Ways and Means 
Ban put up a proposal to use sales taxes, which is not the perfect solution. It's still regressive, but nonetheless, Ben put up a proposal to use sales taxes. He coupled that with a cut in corporate taxes in, in an attempt to try to encourage corporate activity in the state. Um, ben put that up. It couldn't get out of committee. You had this super committee of, of the speaker and chairs of, of important committees sitting there saying they were going to pass a fiscal plan and wouldn't vote for one of the necessary elements of it. When we get to the floor on the constitutional amendment, uh, uh, somebody tries to pull up the sales tax up to the floor to, to, to demonstrate that there's a that we do, are going to have a balance. If you constitutional, constitutionalize the PFD, there are going to be replacement revenues, and so and so it's not it's not like we're going to you know suddenly throw the throw everything out the out the window. We're got, we've got a replacement. Republicans voted against that. Republic it was Republicans who defeated the move to bring sales taxes to the floor. So it's 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 shared. I know Republicans are going to say it was Democrats' fault. It wasn't. It was it was a shared fault between the two. That's the big one. Then uh, on top of that, without without having a fiscal plan, we passed huge increases in spending uh, on the backs of additional PFD cuts. The House essentially caved entirely to the Senate. We didn't have the big battle this year between House Finance and Senate Finance that we had last year because the House essentially caved. I mean, the House passed a budget that cut the PFD and, and agreed to a conference committee report that creates, again, one of these surpluses, what, what, what legislators are calling surpluses, which is additional PFD cuts that, that they haven't appropriated. They're just keeping in reserve. Um, and so it's, I mean, they passed these huge increases. They caved in on having surpluses, not using at least the leftover amount for the PFD. Heck, they didn't even do that. They kept this the surplus reserve, uh, and so and so that went down the that went down the tubes. They did pass, and these are these are bad things. They passed an extension of the senior benefits. They passed an extension of the higher education tax tax credit, and they passed a new child care tax credit. All of which are spending. I mean, tax credits have the word tax in them, but it's sort of two negatives, right? Tax credit equals spending because you're re, because you're reducing revenues. And you're just having the private sector spend the money and then get a tax credit by not having to not having to pay taxes to the state. And they passed all of that additional spending on top of the huge spending increases they did anyway. They passed the state reserve, the, the, the state lending for reserved base loans for Cook Inlet producers. That got that got incorporated into, into the uh, the transmission bill, the electric transmission bill that was over in the Senate and passed both bodies. Um, and so now we're get, now we've set up the state to loan money based on reserves using reserve using as collateral reserves the state already owns. <laughs> it's it's it is it is a Ponzi scheme gone gone crazy because now we have producers who have you know take undertaken lease obligations to develop said well we can't we can't live up to those unless you give us more money unless you give us money. So now we have the state loaning them money on top of loans that the state already had given these producers, Blue Crest, uh, Ada had already given them uh, uh, loans. We now have the state loaning money on top of that based on, based, on, based on reserves that the state already owns. The security, if they fail, if they fail, your, fail to repay the loans, is the state gets the reserves it already owns back. It just pays more for them. So... Uh, the past the state reserve base that was a bad failure to address the permanent fund board chaos. The 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 permanent fund is is board is in chaos. I mean yesterday the, yesterday there was a meeting. There's an article in Must Read about it uh, where they're trying to deal with uh, the uh, the the leak of the emails and the meeting was focused on how do you stop the leak of the emails as opposed to wait a second isn't there a problem that a structural problem with the board the way the board's pressuring. Uh, uh, the staff of the of the permanent fund uh, uh, corporation isn't there a problem that way? No, they're they're more focused on the on on the leak of the emails and on and on rather than on the 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 undue influence that one of the board members and perhaps more than one of the board members are trying to exert uh, exert on uh, uh, the staff. Um, they didn't. So the legislature didn't address the permanent fund board case chaos. It's not like it's you know hidden someplace. It's sitting right there in front of everybody in the in the press. 
a couple of long-term things that the that the legislature really, or one long-term thing, the legislature really didn't even have a bill to do. Well, it may have had a bill, but it sat in committee. And that is past campaign finance reform. We are continuing to operate uh, in, a, in a situation where uh, the top 20% and others can make unlimited contributions to candidates for office, essentially fund those candidates' elections. Uh, one or two or three or four wealthy donors can fund those candidates' elections. Alaska used to have a very uh, uh, democratic system where democratic and small d system where we had you had to get a lot of little donors in order to fund your campaign. You had to reach out and get a broad base among many donors in order to fund your campaign. Now we got a system where two or three people can fund an entire legislative campaign or a gubernatorial, gubernatorial campaign. Bad system. Uh, it encourages, uh, it, it reinforces the fact that top 20% can control the state. Um, and the, legis the legislature, two leg or a legislature ago, two sessions ago, got very close to passing limits, uh, didn't pass at the last minute, never really got any traction um, in this legislature and certainly in this session. And I think that's a bad thing. The final thing, final list, uh, final thing I've got on the list is the governor, once again, failed to provide leadership on fiscal issues. Last session, you'll recall, the governor came out in a, at least came out in a press conference and said, look, I know we got deficits. I know we need to address this issue. Uh, we need to we need to minimize the impact, the adverse impact on any one uh, group. We need to we need to broaden the base and talked about sales taxes. Um, and and at least there was some effort in that regard. Didn't even, he didn't even come close to doing that in this session. He just, you know, wherever the heck he was, he just stayed there and uh, and never really entered the fray. Uh, and it's just leaving. I mean, essentially, the state's being run by the legislature. It's not being run by the governor. And uh, and just left, you know, and just left the building uh, and allowed the legislature to continue to use PFD cuts without even addressing, without even identifying it now as an issue. So I, I, you know, it's an it's yet another session. He was there. Governor was there at the very beginning in the 2019 session when he tried to cut spending. Uh, but he really, increasingly, he hasn't been there since. And this session right, right. was just sort of the bottom of all that. Well, and my question is, because Alaska is in a unique position because we do have a very strong governor. And, uh, I mean, in a perfect in a perfect world, if, uh, if Brad Keithley was governor, would you, I mean, would you have started out the year with, here's my budget? And I'm requiring you all to have a fiscal plan. And if I don't see a fiscal plan, then I'm vetoing pretty much everything until you come up with one. Yeah, that's I mean, what he, is that is that what would have is that what needs to happen for strong leadership to be part of it? Yeah, that's the tool he's got. I mean, the tool he's got is I mean, he has to propose a realistic fiscal plan. He he his budget this year was just, you know, fairy tales. Uh, he has to propose a realistic fiscal plan. But the tool he's got, the only tool he's got is to say, I'm going to veto everything unless you get this resolved. And, and it's a pretty, pretty intense tool. Um, and it's, it's a pretty, I would think, I believe it would be a pretty effective tool, uh, but it's not a tool he's ever brought out. I mean, it, in the 2019 session, what he did was line item vetoes. He proposed a, a, a budget that essentially would pay for, was what the state could afford with traditional revenues plus the leftover from, from the POMB. Um, he proposed that, and and then when we got to the end of the session, uh, he tried to line item veto his way back to that. It didn't hold up. Couldn't even get 16 to support him in the legislature to support him. Um, instead of just sort of look, you didn't do what I asked you to do. I'm the governor. I'm elected statewide. People elected me to do a job. Here's my job. I'm going to veto this until you until you get your act uh, together. Put the put the onus on the legislature. He didn't do that in 2019, and he's certainly not done it since. I mean, there's these occasional stray statements, like last session, say, like last st session statement about, you know, we need to make sure that we don't, you know, impact any one group uh, uh, yeah, inappropriately or more than any other. We need to get a broad base, and sales taxes is, is a way to do that. Occasionally, you get those stray statements like that, but I mean, he didn't even. There wasn't even a stray statement you can hang on to. Um, this session. 
No. And, and the problem is, is that every now and then he does something, you know, that it's good, you know, like the last time the the veto of half the increase of the education and some of these other things. But then he comes back with a with a with a pie in the sky budget on the neck, you know, come around the next session. And you're like, wait a second. You said all these things about understanding our need and not overspending and everything else and that you produce a budget that's already in deficits, you know, or you produce these pie in the sky things with carbon tax credits and all these other things and this fallacious voodoo economics on your deal. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, part of this, I would agree, uh, a big part of this is lack of direction from the governor. I mean, this would have been the perfect storm. This year would have been the perfect storm of it's an election year. They're going to get out. If you would threaten to veto everything without a fiscal plan, they probably would have gotten something done because if not, you're bringing them back for a special session during the summer on an election year and ain't nobody got time for that. They, they would have gotten it done ahead of time. But because you didn't demand a fiscal plan, the few people in the legislature who were trying to get it done basically got railroaded from one side to the other. Yeah, they had no backup from the governor. I mean, yeah. I, I think I think the House went into the House formed Ways and Means. I think Ben took that chairmanship thinking they were going to get backup from the governor and they were going to come through this and have a plan at the end. And the governor just didn't have their backs. I mean, he, 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 the Senate, Bert, you know, stands up and, and bullies them. The Senate last session stands up and bullies them by holding the bills. Um, and the governor says, basically says at the end, OK, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll veto a little bit, but OK, you know, if that's the way you want to play the game. And so we saw the consequence of that. Yeah. This session with the House Finance Committee not even really trying to stand up to him. <laughs> you know what the fiscal plan was. It was the 2575. You stated it several times yesterday. I mean, ex I mean, that was the thing. And I wasn't saying that like uh, that was almost facetious because that's what that's what people like. Gary Stevens kept saying, well, our plan is 2575, or in his case, 7525. But it, I mean, that's not a plan. That, I mean, they, you know, I was trying to make a point of that is not a plan. The plan is we're going to take all the money. The plan is we're going to take 75% of the money for now, and we'll take that other 25 later down the road when we're out of money. But the problem is it's not a long term plan because in two years, the 25 will have to go as well. And it'll be 100%. There is no plan. The plan is to spend every dollar that's available until we run out, and then we'll come back to you and force you to pay some kind of tax. That's the plan. Am I wrong, Brad? No, no. It, and, and Michael, again, I mean, I know we go through this, this loop, but we're already paying taxes. PFD cuts our taxes. They are the diversion of, of, of personal income to the government, diversion of, of personal income provided by statute, uh, clearly provided by law to the government. That is a tax, not only me, but Matt Berman, the longest now serving uh, 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 economist at, uh, at ICER, uh, calls it the same thing. I mean, that is a tax. So it, the question is, are we that we're going to have to pay a tax after this is all over? We're already paying a tax. Middle and lower income Alaska families aren't are already paying a tax. Top 20% non-residents and the oil companies, with to the, to the extent of the additional spending that's going on, aren't paying anything. They aren't contributing to it at all. And so we're all we're, we already have got a tax. It's just a tax that's isolated on middle and lower income Alaska families. We're not even tapping into non-resident income, non-residents, either what they spend in the state or what they earn in the state. We're not tapping into that. 49 other states, the other 49 states, and certainly the District of Columbia do that. Alaska is the only state that doesn't do that. We're not even doing that. We're just forcing it all on middle and lower income Alaska families. That is the plan. We've already got a tax. What now, now the, the issue is when we, when we use up that tax base, when we use up all of the PFD, when we've taxed all of that, we possibly can, what happens next? Um, and frankly, you know, what we're going to, what's going to happen next is probably a sales tax that, that is also regressive hits middle and lower income Alaska families the hardest. And, and we're going to layer that on top of the tax they're already paying in terms of PFD cuts. You know, we wonder why we have out migration or we wonder why we have a migration issue with respect to working Alaska families. Well, it's because we're taxing the hell out of them, both in terms of the PFDs that we're taking now and in terms of the prospect of where we're going after we, after we run through the tax, the PFD tax base. So it's a, yeah, it's a plan, <laughs> maybe, but it's a plan. It's a plan for failure. It's a plan 
It's a plan that's designed to keep the top 20% and, and non-resident uh, and non-residents and oil uh, out of the loop, out of the out of responsibility, not only now, but as much as they can uh, into the future. And that's it's a bad plan. How about that? We may have a plan, no, but it's a bad it, plan. It is. Uh, and Ron kind of hits the nail on the head because we've said this several times. He says Stevens and the rest of those who took the whole PFD will be gone and living in another state when it's all said and done. They don't count now. Why would they care then? I mean, this yep. has been a problem. This has been a problem in the legislature for years. Many legislators who make these raw fiscal ideas and, and make these decisions that are painful in the long term, maybe beneficial in the short term, but painful in the long term. And then they up and retire and they leave and they go to another state. So they don't care. They're not going to pay the they're not going to pay the price on that. But here's the point. The Republicans have to step up. If the Republicans don't like that, the Republicans have to step up and do something about it in terms of replacement revenues, because we've long since passed the point. Long since passed the point where we can fund the government that we've built through uh, through traditional revenues from oil and through uh, uh, the remainder of the POMV after the statutory PFDs paid for it. Long since past that point. We ain't going back there. And, and so the Republicans, if they, really, if they really believe in this issue, and this is where I have a problem with a lot of Republicans anymore, to tell you the truth, because they mouth these words. They mouth these words, oh, we got to restore the PFD, you know, respect the law. We got to abide by the current law. They mouth those words, but they don't follow through with with the replacement revenues that are necessary to to make those words come true it's right. like you know it's like oh i'll tell you what you want to hear but but over here on the side i'm not going to do what it takes to actually deliver what i'm telling you uh that that you want to hear and it and to me the republicans are as at as much at fault on this issue as the democrats no, I mean, I totally agree at, at this point. And for all those Republicans that are out there straining at the bit about, uh, you know, socialism and everything else. Hey, Jack, I didn't write the Constitution. And in fact, the PFD is the one capitalistic issue that can be utilized against the communistic issue of this collective ownership. But, you know, hey, you do you. It's your lie. You tell it. That's how you go. Brad, uh, number three, nine days till the uh, filing deadline for the upcoming election. Some of the lines have been drawn, 40 uh, House members and 10 of the 20 senators are up for re-election. Um, so a big chunk of both bodies uh, up there, big chunk of, of the legislature as a whole. What are your thoughts on the upcoming election? What are you seeing? What are, what are you thinking right now? Well, one of the things that struck me as I go, as I look through the list is there's a lot of, a lot of races that don't have opponents yet, or a lot of races that don't have you know, quality opponents, well-funded opponents uh, in those races. So if we don't, if we don't change the players to use a term that you've, that you've used before on the show, if we don't change the players. We're not, it, it's, it's sort of foolish to think we're going to change the outcome uh, in future legislatures, particularly when the governor doesn't stand up. So uh, we elected a governor to stand up. He's not standing up. So it's up to the legislature. The legislature's running the state. If we don't have opponents to the, to the people who are in the legislature now, then we're not going to get any change in results. So, part of the part of the issue I see ahead is 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 there really are there really going to be candidates to support uh, uh, that are going to are going to change the dynamics? One or two here. Big race to me is Ben Carpenter's challenge to uh, uh, Bjorkman Jesse Bjorkman in the uh, in the Kenai for that Senate seat, the Senate seat that Bjorkman now holds now holds, we've got a quality candidate there that would make a huge change uh, in the in, in where that seat's going. Uh, you know, theoretically, it's Republican on Republican, but Bjorkman is 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 a, a spend Republican. If he's a Republican at all, it's just a spendican Republican. And Ben would certainly be a big change there. But that's the, that's that's the that's more the exception than the rule in the number of races we see out there. So part of the part of the issue is Part of the part of my outlook is: Are we really going to have an opportunity to make changes, or are we just going to, you know, are by default, are we just going to sort of end up where we where we already are? To me, the three issues that I'm going to ask candidates, or I'm going to look be looking at what candidates say about this in the race, are one: What's your fiscal plan? Who pays? 
and and what do you want to spend and do you have offsets in mind i mean there's going to be races um uh in in anchorage state state house races in anchorage i mean the democrats are gearing up to run strong races in in uh, in anchorage uh and there's and they're going to be candidates who who say um you know i'm i want to spend more i want k through 12 i'm running to you know, fully fund K through 12 to make a permanent increase in the BSA. The, my question to them is going to be who pays? I mean, how, how, how are you going to pay for that? And if they, if they mumble around and mope around, then, you know, clearly they have in mind the PFD paying middle and lower income Alaska families. They don't want their top 20% donors or them themselves when they become top 20% by virtue of being elected to the legislature. Uh, they're going to be, you know, essentially status quo. So, you know, there's no real thrill uh, electing more people into the status quo we've got. By the same token on Republicans, I mean, the question is, this, this, it's the same question to them. Who pays? We got Republicans out there who are going to say we ought to be, you know, we, we ought to be holding the line on spending. That's fine. But we're still in a huge deficit that we've been covering with PFD cuts. Are you, the Republican candidate, are you going to continue to use PFD cuts to fund, to fund, those, to fund those deficits that we've got and will continue to have? And if they, you know, mumble around, then the answer is, well, they're part of the problem too. And we're going to have races out there, Michael, where we got, where both candidates are part of the problem. Democrats are saying, I want to, I want to, you know, make a permanent increase to the BSA. I want to do, you know, changes to defined benefits, increase spending that way. And who will mumble around when asked who pays. And then we got Republicans who say, well, I want to hold the line on spending, but, but I don't want anybody else to pay. And so, and so we're going to have these races that are just sort of useless, in terms of, in terms of changing the dynamic, yeah, right. we may we may hold back spending a little bit, but we're still going to be doing it at the expense of middle and lower income Alaska families. So that's issue one. Issue well, two, I'm go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm just going to say that, and the, a prime example of that again goes back to your talking about the 2018, 2019 when he couldn't get 16 Republicans, the governor couldn't get 16 Republicans to back up his vetoes because they're like, oh, I'm all for cuts, just not in my backyard. Yeah, exactly right. And it's just, I mean, so I, that's sort of what we've commented. We, we've fallen into this, into this policy of, of 2575 by, by Republicans fail uh, in part by Republicans failing to propose alternative substitute revenues. And, and if that's, you know, and, and if we're going to have Republican candidates, candidates who claim to be fiscal conservatives, but candidates who, who are not prepared to step up and say, we need subs alternative revenues, replacement revenues. Here's what I propose. If we have candidates who are, who are not prepared to do that, then they're sort of, you know, to, to, to use a term I'll regret later, they're sort of worthless candidates. I mean, they're just, they're, they're not, they're not going to move the ball forward. We're just going to keep the ball where it is. Right. Second issue. What's your approach to the Cook Inlet? I mean, we're going to have a lot of people, you know, screaming about, we have an, an emergency, the, the, we have a crisis. We need to do something and they'll come up with all sorts of different ideas on how to do it. it. It's going to be a defining issue to me, whether we have people who believe in the free market uh, or we have people who, you know, want government intervention. And again, the really the real oddity of this particular issue is we have Republicans who are pushing forward on intervention. George Rauscher to, to pick one, Tom McKay to pick another who are pushing forward on, well, government has to do something. And so we're going to give government money away in order to, in order to do it. We're going to subsidize the result we want. And we have Democrats, Donna Mears being a good example, uh, who are saying, no, 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 let's let the free market work. I mean, let, let's not spend, I mean, they say let's spend on other things, but, but at least on this particular issue, they, they stand up and they say, let's, let's let the free market work. So, that to me is also going to be a defining issue. Do we have real free market candidates in this state or do we have free market up until the time I really want to subsidize somebody uh, right, uh, right. candidates? Third, the third thing is what's your position on campaign finance reform? I, I think, I mean, it didn't get addressed a lot in this legislature, but I think campaign finance reform is a huge issue. I, the fact that we can have you know, millionaires and billionaires funding candidates directly, just funding campaigns directly, I think is a huge problem. I mean, after you get elected, who are you gonna who are you gonna listen to? Who are you gonna pay attention to? The guy who the guy who funded your campaign, right? You may say that you're gonna be looking at other at, for input from other areas, but the guy who funded your campaign or the the two guys or three guys or four guys that funded your campaign is who you're gonna be listening to the most. 
we used to have a very democratic system with, with fairly strict funding limits, uh, which required that you went out and you go out and get a broad base of support and that you had to explain yourself to a broad base and that you had to, you know, convince a broad base of people to support you in terms of, in terms of, in terms of dollars. And so when you got elected, you weren't, uh, uh, uh focused on, on one or two people. You had a broad base that you had to respond to. Um, now we've got a system which allows one or two to step in and buy and essentially buy either senatorial or uh, representative seats or you know, buy the governorship, essentially. And, and I just think that's a very bad system. We need to re-democratize uh, our funding system. What happened was the Ninth Circuit said those limits were too low. They, they impeded uh, freedom of speech, but they didn't, say, they didn't say you couldn't have any limits. They said you had to modernize the limits take into account inflation to get up to a to get up to a certain level. We need to do that. We we should have done that the day after the Ninth Circuit issued the decision. We needed we should have done it last legislature. We need to do that. That needs to be a, an important part of what the legislature is doing. Redemocratize uh, the field. And I and frankly, I think that would help the PFD issue. I'd help, I think it'd help the fiscal issue if people had to reach out to middle uh, income Alaska families to help uh, to help fund their campaigns. Um, and I, and so I think that's a third issue that I'm going to be looking for in terms of the campaign. We're down to the last minute here. I want to give you the last word, Brad. I don't know if you had any more, but <clears throat> give us your final thoughts here as we wrap things up. My final thoughts is a, are we going to get candidates? We'll know that in nine days. B once we get the candidates, are they going to be the right candidates that push for changes in the things that have, that have gone wrong? And those are the three issues I'm going to be looking at to, to decide whether we have, uh, whether we have good candidates. Well, it's, uh, it's a little disappointing to see some of the same candidate slates come up again and again, especially with the business as usual crowd in a lot of cases facing no, in, no challengers in their races, which is disappointing to say the least. Even a stop clock is right twice a day and Harold, uh, I think, uh, nails it here. 16,055 PFD versus 22,000 per capita government spending. That's the issue. That's what we've been trying to talk about for a long time. Um, and yet you know, the size and scope of government, right sizing government. And yet nobody, you know, what you, you get people like Bert Stedman saying we couldn't cut another dollar. You get, uh, you know, people saying we couldn't possibly live in a smaller footprint um, and candidates who say that they want a full PFD. Um, and some of them really, truly do, I believe it, but they're a vast minority in the legislature. Even the, even the left-leaning progressive Legislators representing some of the most, you know, the poorest districts in the state are not standing up for a PFD for their constituency. I mean, the people who you would think would be fighting tooth and nail for that, you know, three thousand, four thousand dollar dividend for their low income people who are making twenty thousand bucks a year would make a significant difference in their lives. And they're saying, no, they're too stupid to do it on their own. We need to guide their money and that money needs to come to government so we can take care of them. That's what it's coming down to. We uh, we have no incentives to keep spending under control. The incentives go the uh, the opposite way. Legislature has no incentive, no personal incentive. They're all in the top twenty percent by virtue of the of the of the raise that they voted themselves. They're donors <laughs> because we don't have campaign finance limits. They're donors who maybe you know three or four people uh, don't have don't have uh, incentives to uh, reduce spending because they don't pay for it. Uh, the oil companies don't have incentives to push back on spending because they don't pay for it. Non-resident industries, fishing, tourism, uh, the like, don't have uh, don't have incentives to push back on spending. All the incentives are on increasing spending uh, because you know you were pointing out Zach Fields, the a person who represents a fairly low income uh, uh, district, but nevertheless you know pushes for PFD cuts. The incentives are to increase spending on government. Because either A, Zach Fields unions uh, are the beneficiary of that, or B, another representative's uh, uh, construction companies are the beneficiary of that, uh, or C, you know, government employees uh, generally are the beneficiary of that. That's, that's where the incentives are, because then that, that generates campaign support uh, among the construction company, the construction company owners, among the, gov the government employees, employee unions among the other trade groups, it generates support among them for, for their election because we don't have campaign finance reform and because those people, those donors, we've set up a system where those donors don't have to, don't have to pay. So the incentives are all screwed up. 
I mean, Alaska virtually alone, because we don't have a broad-based tax, the only state that doesn't have a broad-based tax, virtually alone, we've, we, we incentivize growth in government, both among donors and among, and among representatives and among legislators. We incentivize the growth of government. We don't incentivize constraints uh, on government. And until we get that, until we change that, until we change, you know, until we have campaign finance reform and require that people go back to raising money from, you know, a broad, broad group of uh, people uh, for their candidacy until we, until we have, you know, uh, an obligation on, on the part of the top 20% and non-resident industries and, and, and the oil companies to sort of, you know, pay something. And so a pushback on, uh, a pushback on spending as a result, until we change those incentives, we're going to keep going down. We're going to keep going down this road. It's all about incentives. It's all about the economic incentives that we've created uh, in this state with respect to spending. And all the incentives are on the side of increased spending as opposed to pushing right. back. Spending. Well, and again, <clears throat> you're, you're alluding to that disconnect between the private and public sector where the public sector is protected at all costs and the private sector is not even an afterthought. It's just there. If it survives, great. If it doesn't, great, because it doesn't matter to us. We're in the government and we, you know, we have direct access to all the money and we can do whatever we want. And that's a unique situation that Alaska is in that no other state is facing. And we don't have the political will to address that issue. Um, you know, everybody can talk about a fiscal plan, but until somebody actually does something, here we are. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, everybody does talk about it. I mean, everybody, Republicans complain about, oh my gosh, that spending is out of control, but then they vote for things. I mean, they vote to finance it by PFD cuts. Uh, they vote to finance it uh, in a way that, uh, or they vote finance their campaigns in a way that where they don't have to really worry about a broad base of donors. The Republicans ha talk a good game, but they don't, they don't follow through on it. The Democrat, oddly enough, the Democrats don't talk a good game, but sometimes they follow through on the right things. Right. Um, so it's a it, uh, it's a screwed up state. One one final sort of example of how screwed up we are. There is a there's a new article out or a new book out on on the benefits of ranked choice voting. And one of the chapters is on Kathy Giesel and and on, you know, Alaska and using Kathy Giesel as an example of the great things of, of ranked choice voting and the great things of bipartisanship. W one of one of the most important lessons I learned with my involvement with the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget at the at the federal level, is is that bipartisanship just really means both sides get to spend and somebody else pays for it. At the federal level, Republicans and Democrats, I mean, they sort of talk about it differently, but they both are are they want to spend, but they don't want to pay for it. And so the way we handle that is through debt. We push it off on future Alaska, we have future generations. In Alaska, we don't we don't push it off on debt. We push it off on middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts. And so bipartisanship is, is really just, yeah, we both agree we want to spend, but neither of us want to pay for it. So who could, can we find somebody to dump these costs on? And they've done that both at the federal level in terms of debt, taxes on future generations, and in Alaska, PFD cuts, taxes on, on middle and lower income Alaska families. We, we've got to change the system. We've got to change the system. Absolutely. Um, and that's something we've been fighting for in this program for 25 years. Unfortunately, nobody's listening, it seems like. I mean, there's a few of you listening, obviously, but nobody that's making a difference at this point, which is frustrating. Brad, thank you so much. As always, it's good to talk with you, my friend. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.